Hi, uh, welcome back, and thanks for uh, still being here. Um, the last time we discussed um, the polynomial partitioning proof of the semi trouble theorem, which is about incidences between points and lines on the plane. And then uh, today we are going to discuss um, how to uh, like how to make a lot of changes for the polynomial partitioning techniques and and we will uh, work on a toy problem that is uh, the Kakea problem in R2. We are not going to prove the Kakea problem in R2, even if, even though it was solved many years ago, we, we're, we're just going to prove a very weak version, but this method will, um, uh, will be um, more powerful in higher dimensions. So um, the, the Kakea problem, set is um, a, set, a union of tubes of say radius one and length n where n is a large number pointing in one over n separated directions. And then the conjecture is that uh, the union of the tubes should have large volume. Uh, roughly speaking, the, if the tubes are pointing in separated directions, we should morally think that they do, they do not overlap too much. And this conjecture in dimension two was solved by Davis. And uh, when dimension n is greater or equal to three, it is wide open. And when n is three, the, the best known bounds was due to, I, I should write Tom Wolf here, um, is due to Wolf. That's, um, that's the dimension um, of the set is greater than uh, five halves. And then um, Katz, Laba, and Tao, they proved and one uh, five halves plus epsilon in Minkowski dimension. And then um, recent, in, in the recent years, this was improved by Katz and Zhao, uh, also for an, an epsilon improvement, but for the Hausdorff dimension. And for dimension n greater or equal to four, the best known bounds was uh, due to Goose Zhao, Zhao and uh, Hickman, Rogers, and Zhang. All this method uses polynomial partitioning. As one can see that polynomial partitioning is more powerful when the dimension gets larger. But today we are going to just work on a toy case. Um, so last time we also discussed that uh, the set of R-rich points for a set of tubes is the, those points such that there are more than R tubes in T passing through this X. And by pigeonholing that there exists an R greater than N to the epsilon such that uh, R times the, the volume of R rich points is greater than N times the number of tubes divided by log N. So if this does not hold, then um, by double counting, the Kakea conjecture is already true, so we don't have to do anything. Um, so this is a small re uh, recap from last time. And then the polynomial partitioning uh, for on this, the set of average points is say, in general, if we have an L1 function that is positive, and then we, for example, we can think this L1 function G as the characteristic function of the set of R rich points. Then the polynomial partition says that for any integer d, there exists a polynomial q of degree smaller or equal to d such that um, the complement of its zero set is divided into um, connected components uj. So so those are the uh, connected components. And this is um, Z cube, such that the integral of G on each UJ is below average. And the number of those connected components is D to the, on the order of D to the N. Then uh, recall that uh, when we proved the uh, submerged trailer theorem, the strategy for lines is there, there are two key points. So for example, every line does not contain 
is not contained in the zero set of the polynomial, it passes through at most d cells, uh, uj. And also, and also there uh, d to the n many cells. So this number is uh, fairly large compared to the number of cells that a line passes through. So that, that makes us uh, think that we can use the divide and conquer strategy. We divide into so many cells and they have um, a fairly small interaction so we can conquer them. Uh, but this property, as we can see, is not true for uh, skinny tubes. And how do we make, them tr make it true? The, uh, the second property is that there are a few limes in, in the zero set of the polynomial. For example, if degree Q is D, then there are uh, the number of lines in ZQ is smaller than a D. So what we can ask, is this still true for tubes? Well, we, we need to make sense of what does it mean for a tube lie in a, in a zero set. So, uh, so we, we have to make one and two rigors in some way. And so imagine we are uh, back take say eight or nine years ago, we, we see this beautiful proof of uh, polynomial partitioning uh, on the summary Schroeder theorem. And we see this analog that uh, lines looks um, quite similar to skinny tubes. And we want to apply this polynomial partitioning technique. How, how are we going to um, address this method? Um, so now let's see uh, the, st the strategy for tubes is the following. And so last time I, I discussed uh, why we think this is useful and there are some uh, simple minded uh, adjustment that didn't work. But this time let's see what's, uh, what works. Um, so we have this polynomial Q this is the zero set of Q. And we are going to do some uh, small uh, changes. So we, we multiply this polynomial Q by another polynomial of uh, about the same degree. Say so G is the polynomial that parameterizes the D times D grid of distance N over D. So first of all, we can assume that uh, everything happens inside a ball of radius capital N, because if the tubes, they, do, they are not inside a ball, that's even better. So since the degree of Q is D, so, and then this grid also, and the, the polynomial that, that parameterize this grid also have degree say 2D. So the degree of, um, Q prime is still bounded by a constant times D. So this notation means a constant, an absolute constant times D. And now uh, this is just um, something that I found useful, but we don't really need it in, in this proof, but I, I find it useful and intuitive. And then let Z be the zero set of Q prime. So, and let uh, w be the one neighborhood of Z. This means one neighborhood of Z. I, I should have made those thicker, but uh, this, this will make the picture messy, so I prefer not to do it. And now, um, so, so why are we going to take one neighborhood? Because we want to make the previous, the first point true, meaning that the uh, tubes do not uh, passing through too many cells. So now the, the, the complement of this one neighborhood of the zero set is divided into connected components. And then the, we call them OJ. So we, we call those OJ, we call it a cell. And then, so those OJs are the previous UJ um, set minus the neighborhood of the polynomial. In particular, it lies inside 
a ball of radius capital N over D. And this is because of the treatment we have because we multiply by this uh, uh, the, the polynomial G. Now we have the key point. Each tube, if it does not lie in W, it intersects at most D cells or J. So I think this uh, can be dropped. So each tube, because it lies in the, if it lies in W, then it does not intersect any cell. So each tube intersects this many cells OJ. And now we have property one that we want. So, um, so we call it cellular case if, so the, the, let G be the characteristic function of the uh, set of average points. Then the cellular case is that the cells, the integration of cells dominant. So, so far this case seems um, pretty similar to what we have seen before. But now we have thickened this uh, polynomial, the, 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 this algebraic curve. So we make the algebraic case more complicated. The, the algebraic case is uh, defined by when the integral on G of G on this neighborhood polynomial uh, uh, neighborhood dominates. And this case will become more complicated and we have to deal, deal with it carefully. Okay, I think uh, okay. So uh, no questions so far. Um, so how, how do we deal with this um, algebraic case? So first of all, as before, the, the this average points inside W is contained in um, the R over two reach points for a set of tangential tubes and the R over two reach points for a set of transversal tubes. But how, how do we define those tubes. So morally speaking, we want to say that let this um, be the neighborhood. We want to say that this red tube is tangential and we want to say that this green tube is transversal. But we want to define it in the way that a tube is, if it intersects this W, the, the neighborhood, then it is either tangential or transversal. So our goal is to say that there are not too many tubes in, in the, there are not too many tangential tubes. And also each transversal tube intersect this neighborhood in not too many times. So that's our goal. And the way we do it is, um, we choose a parameter delta arbitrarily small, and we cover the whole space um, by balls BK of radius n to the one minus delta. And then we define uh, for each BK, we define a set of tangential tubes to the BK as the set of tubes T such that it intersect our ball, like the, the intersection of this T between, the, uh, between the, the tube and the ball lies inside the, um, the neighborhood. And also we have for any X in, for any X in, in T intersected, So let, let me draw a picture. So the tangential is so for any x inside t intersect this bk and any z um, for example let's say this is our z in 
the zero in the uh, algebraic curve intersect BK such that the distance between X and Z is bounded by um, a constant times the radius of the tube. Then the angle between uh, the directions, the direction of the, the tube, that is this direction, and the tangent line when we are in dimension two, the tangent line of Z at our point small z, the angle is bound, bounded by n to the minus one plus epsilon. So when, when we think epsilon as, uh, as zero, then this essentially says that the direction of T is the same as the tangent line. But we need this epsilon, oh, sorry, we need this delta to, um, to be a extremely small positive number so that we can um, deal with the transversal case, that the transversal tubes. So now we have finished defining the set of tangential tubes. The set of transversal tubes is defined as those tubes that intersect BK. I think also intersect W. And it does not belong to the tangential tubes. Okay. Um, any question on this definition? Okay, now, so here is the lemma saying that um, the transversal tubes do not intersect the, um, the zero set, do not intersect the neighborhood um, too many times. So the proof of the lemma is by an um, induction dimension. So let's see, see the statement. The statement says that if T is a, a tube rectangle of width one and with central axis, uh, L. Suppose that Z is a smooth algebraic curve, and we define this Z greater than alpha as the set of point in Z such that the angle between uh, the tangent line and uh, axis L is larger than alpha. For example, when we try to apply to the transversal case, this alpha will be n to the minus one plus delta. Then the conclusion of the lemma says that this z greater than alpha intersect t is contained in a union of degree z square many balls of radius alpha to the minus one. Um, points in Z cap um, right right uh, well sorry no uh, <laughs> points th thanks for the uh, question but the, the points are not not necessary on Z cap L that's the so the point here is the points are in Z intersect T Because if it's in Z intersect L, that's um, we already know that there won't be the, the number of those points is bounded by degree Z plus one. That, that's the answer to your question, uh, Harold. Um, so let's digest this uh, statement of the lemma. So let's compare to the definition of tangential tubes. So the, a transversal tube can be sort of viewed as uh, the complement of the tangential tubes. So here 
in particular in this definition when we think as the, the opposite saying that for there exists a Z and X such that X minus Z uh, when with X minus Z smaller than one such that the angle is greater than n to the minus one plus delta. And that is the, the corresponding definition of the transversal juice. So, so when we apply the lemma to the transversal tube, the conclusion is that the number of times that a transversal tube intersect W is bounded by degree Z squared times a constant. Okay, uh, the, I, I stated this lemma in dimension two because I want to make things simpler, but it is not too hard to generalize uh, to higher dimensions. So this lemma is true in higher dimension. Um, so without loss of generality, we can assume that L is parameterized by x1 equals to zero. And by rescaling on x2 coordinate only, we can reduce to the case, uh, we can reduce the case to alpha equals to one. And then um, here is a, a common trick um, in, in this um, technique. Let W be um, zero, zero, one over 100, two over 100, three over 100. So it's like a, a one over 100 net on the unit interval. Then we define this ZW as the set of Z, um, a set of points such that the angle between the tangent line and L is W. So I want to say that th those numbers that are, they are not strictly, so, so we don't really need them to be one over 100. So one over 100 plus one over 1000 is also okay. So we can choose them in a small neighborhood and this will not impact the R proof. By choosing those W in the small neighborhood will allows us to use some Sarsing uh, theorem and, and have nice property about the, the, the ZW. But this is not so important in, in dimension two. Then by the Zeus theorem, there exists that the number of points in ZW is bounded by uh, degree Z square because this is also an algebraic, equa algebraic e equation of degree bounded by uh, degree Z. Then we can cover those points by balls of radius 10. So those are the, the orange circles. Um, so those are the points in ZW. And we cover them by um, balls of radius 10. Now, now we have covered those points. Let's look at what else. Let Z be a point in Z greater than one intersect T and does not lie in the balls, those balls, those orange circle balls. Now let A be a connected component of, so let's see. For example, this is a point C. That lies inside this C greater than one intersect T and not inside any of the orange uh, circle then let A be a connected component. Um, say A is this one. I'm making this connected component too large, but um, let A be this connected component. This is A. Then we claim that the connected component A does not touch any point in ZW. Um, the reason is that um, 
if it touches, then since the radius of t is one, if a touches any point in ZW, then the a should be contained in one of these orange circles, but it does not. So a does not touch any point in ZW. And this means that a cuts through L. Because uh, we, don't, we, we don't have something that looks like um, this. So this means that A needs to be uh, like cutting through L. Then as a conclusion, this A Sorry, what I wanted to say is that here we have this T. We can, sometimes we can have something, something like A looks like this, but this is not true because if A looks like this, then A needs to go through a point in ZW. And we, what we just said forbid this from happening. So not happening. And now we can bound the, the, num the number of those A's cutting through L by Bezu's theorem again. So the number of A is bounded by degree Z. And, and now we finish the proof of the lemma. I will pause and see if there are questions. Okay. And now as a corollary, each rectangle belongs to d square many um, k, um, d square many sets of tangential tubes, uh, of transversal tubes. So a tube can be transversal to d square many balls. Now let's look at the set of um, tangential tubes to a, to a ball. So here we need another lemma that's called Vonkius lemma. So the goal is to show that there are not too many tubes inside this, there are not too many tangential tubes. So Vonkius lemma says that if P is a non-zero polynomial of degree D in Rn, then the volume of a large ball intersecting this one neighborhood of the zero set is bounded by a constant only depending on n times degree d times l to the n minus one. So it's a, it's a lemma in a real algebra geometry. So we, but the proof also uses Bezu theorem. So we take a neighborhood and we intersect with a large ball and we ask what's the volume. So again the proof is also by induction dimension. Uh, I, I found these two proofs uh, a little uh, similar in spirit so I put them together. Um, so by uh, milner tom theorem the number of connected components of Zp is bounded by a constant only depending on the dimension times d to the n. Then that means that the number of unit cubes containing a component of Zp is bounded by d to the n. For example, we want to get rid of those cubes as you already see it. So we want to get rid of those cubes because Z, Zp does not intersect the face of those cubes. And Milner-Tom theorem tells us that those 
the number of those cubes is bounded by d to the n. And now if a cube intersects zp, but not containing a component of zp, that, that for example, not one of those blue cubes, then one of its face must intersect zp. Uh, like, for example, like this purple cube, then this face intersect zp. Now we can apply induction on dimension, meaning that um, we can apply induction saying that, um, for example, all those faces, so the number of the volume on those uh, of ZP intersecting, the, so the we, are, we apply this Vonkius lemma on those faces. And, and that's the, uh, that finished the proof. Um, if there are no questions, I will proceed. So the corollary um, is that when dimension n equals to two, the number of distinct one times L rectangles in the one neighborhood of an algebraic curve intersect a large ball of radius L is bounded by the, the degree Z square, uh, a constant times degree Z square. However, this corollary or the in higher dimensions is, is very non-trivial. But a key ingredient is also the von Kuhl's lemma in higher dimension. But um, and this was proved by um, Katz and Rogers. Um, using some tools from a semi-algebraic geometry. Now here uh, we are going to see a proof of a, of a weak estimate for Kakea set in R2. The estimate is really weak, but I want to um, illustrate some ideas like how we uh, use polynomial partitioning for those for um, a set of tubes. So first of all, we do polynomial partitioning with uh, polynomial Q of degree uh, D bounded by an N to the epsilon square. Or we can also let this um, say degree D equals to a large constant only depending on epsilon that we will choose it later. Um, and both ways are fine for now. Um, now let W be the one neighborhood of the um, algebraic curve. And again, this, the complement of W is divided into cells O J. The cellular case is one is when um, the volume of I rich points is bounded by D squared times the volume of I rich points inside each um, cell. So here T J is defined as the set of j t such that t intersect all j no empty. And then by an average argument, the number of tubes in tj is bounded by the number of tubes divided by d. This is because uh, we have d square many, d square many uh, cells and the number of cells that the tube passing through is bounded by D. So this is the cellular case. So we, we collect information and this is the information we collect. And then for the algebraic case, um, as before we have 
the volume of r rich points is bounded by the volume of r over two rich points for the set of tangential tubes, and the volume of r over two rich um, points for the set of transversal tubes. But in in this special case, we we can uh, ignore those transversal tubes just because we have uh, pigeonholed at the beginning and say that r tan R times the volume of Irish points is larger than n times the number of tubes divided by log n. Because that means that means that for a typical tube, almost all points, like at least one over log n fraction of the points, should lie in this Irish point. But we already know from the from previous, uh, from the corollary concerning the tangential tubes, that each tube in the, uh, sorry, for the corollary con uh, concerning the transversal tubes, that each tube in, each transversal tube intersects W in uh, D square over N to the epsilon fraction of the points. So the fraction is, um, remember D is just a large constant. So the fraction is a way smaller than one over log n fraction. And that's why we can uh, ignore this part. Now, now let's focus on the tangential part. And by this corollary, the number of tangential tubes is bounded by an n to the two epsilon. So n to the two epsilon is the number of those large balls that we used to, def we, we used to define uh, tangential and transversal tubes, and then times d square, and d square is this number. So in particular, it's bounded by n to the three epsilon. So this is a fairly small number uh, compared to n. Okay. Now we iterate this process for uh, tj that is the set of tubes intersecting a cell until the tangential case is dominant. So the picture is um, maybe I will add a page. So the picture is we first do a polynomial partitioning and imagine that it's cellular case dominant because the uh, tangential case cannot dominate because they are not that the, the number of tangential tubes is very small. And we also know that each cell is contained in an N over D uh, a ball of radius N over D. So we have so those are the tubes from TJ. Let's say it's OJ. And then since we only consider what happens inside OJ, we um, we see that the now the length of the tube becomes. Um, the length of the tube becomes an n over d. And then we perform polynomial partitioning again inside OJ. And Let's call it OJ, uh, not OJ. So this is the cell, cells in the second step, O tilde. And each O tilde is, lies inside a ball of radius N over D square. And we, we keep partitioning until uh, we arrive at tangential cases. 
um, so now assume that we arrive at tangential cases. This picture does not, does not look so similar to the show. So assume that the, we, the, the partitioning polynomial is like something like this, and we are at tangential cases. And, and now we can use the number of tubes in the tangential cases to, to give an estimate. So here is, uh, we say it in words what we just done. We, what we have just done. So we iterate this process for Tj until tangential case is dominant. Then since the previous steps are cellular case dominant, then the volume of average points is bounded by d square times the volume of average points inside one cell. And then it's also bounded um, by, let's say we have m steps of cellular cases before we arrive at the tangential cases, the, the, the tangential case. So it's bounded by d to the 2m times the number of average points for t tilde. Um, so to simplify the notation, we can write capital D equals to small d to the m. That's um, so assume M steps of cellular case cases. Now the number of tube segments inside T tilde is roughly um, the number of tubes divided by D. So this is a consequence of um, the fact that each tube intersect at most D cells at each step. And we also have the set of Average points for t tilde is bounded by the set, the, the volume of r over two rich points for uh, t tilde tangential, and this is just rewrite until tangential cases dominant. But we also know that here assume that this is o tilde, and it's inside an capital N over capital D ball. So the number of capital N over capital D times one rectangles in each iterated cell is this square. Um, is I think D square times D to the epsilon. And this is an application of our corollary at scale n over capital D. Then the number of tangential um, rectangles inside one cell is bounded by capital D times n to the epsilon. So this implies that D square is so we combine this inequality and also this inequality. So it implies that we have an upper bound and also a lower bound about the number of tubes. So then D capital D is should be larger than n to the one half. And then we have plugging in, we have the volume of average points should be larger than n to the three halves. 
So all, all this um, argument is like uh, kind of heuristic, but um, so this give you um, like uh, gives us some idea if we want to use polynomial partitioning to study uh, the Kakea conjecture or even the restriction conjecture, what, what, like, what, what kind of intuition should we have? So here I want to say that this is a very, very weak bound because the conjecture or uh, actually the theorem in n equals two, two is that um, those, so, so this is under the condition that r times p r t is the dominating r. So this is larger than n times the number of tubes divided by log n. So the theorem is the union of the tubes is large, has volume larger than n to the two minus epsilon. So here we only have n to the three halves and that's, um, that's pretty um, small compared to what we wanted. But as we have seen earlier, or we have discussed earlier that this method becomes more powerful in higher dimensions. Okay, um, I, I will pause and see if there are questions. Okay, um, if no questions, then um, we, let's summarize we, what we have um, done. We, we have um, discussed how to um, change this polynomial partition so that it works for tubes. And we have discussed um, how to decompose the set of tubes into tangential ones and also transversal ones. And we have estimate, we have two lemmas saying that the first one says that uh, a transversal tube do not intersect the polynomial neighborhood, the zero set, the neighborhood of the zero set too many times. And we also have a lemma saying that the union of the tangential tubes should have bounded volume uh, by Bonkius lemma. And those are the key tools that we are going to use for uh, to study uh, restriction conjecture using polynomial partition. So now, the, recall that the restriction conjecture says the following. If we have a function f from the unit disk uh, in dimension n minus one to the complex number, then we define the extension operator EFX as e to the two pi i times x1 c1 plus um, many things plus xn minus one times c n minus one plus xn times c square and then times fc dc. So this, um, so we, the function is defined um, this unit ball and then extension operator is like, now we, the Fourier transform of EF will be supported on the paraboloid. So previously when we discussed the restriction uh, conjecture, we discussed it with respect to a sphere, but uh, usually the things what works for sphere also works for the paraboloid and vice versa. But the paraboloid is um, slightly easier to uh, describe. So we choose the paraboloid version. And the conjecture says that for any P greater than two N over N minus one, uh, the, LP norm, the LP norm of EF is bounded by a constant times the L infinity norm of F. So Previously, we have what inside is 
uh, Rn, but when we have a large ball of radius R and that R goes to, inf to infinity, this will give a estimate for Rn. And we can have a even, um, we can even have a further reduction. So we, we can replace this CP to be an constant depending on P and, P and epsilon and then times R to the epsilon. So we, now we allow a loss of R to the epsilon power. So now epsilon is any small positive number. And, and if we have this local and weaker version of the restriction inequality, then there is an epsilon removal lemma by tau. saying that we have the stronger bound um, for any p delta greater than p. Uh, assuming that we have this inequality for any small epsilon, positive epsilon. So for the rest of the lectures, we are going to focus on this uh, slightly weaker estimate. And also I want to say that this L infin infinity norm on the right hand side, if um, maybe people have seen that in the first lecture we discussed the restriction conjecture, the, the right hand side is an LQ norm. And since F is, has, uh, is compactly supported, LQ norm is smaller than L infinity norm, but there is um, by some factorization, factorization theorem, if we have this L infinity bound, then we can also have an LQ bound on the right hand side. So um, after many reductions, we are, we are going to stick to this, trying to prove this weaker, this weaker estimate. And so this restriction conjecture seems a very um, a conjecture in uh, like very analytic conjecture. How does it, uh, how is it connected to um, the, the Kekea conjecture that we have discussed? So this is done via the wave packet de decomposition in a large ball of radius R. So consider in dimension N, a ball of radius R centered at the origin. And then we can cover this unit ball in dimension N minus one by smaller disks, or sometimes we call them caps, theta of radius R to the minus a half. So those are, we cover them by theta. And uh, it's like, it's a finitely overlapping covering. And then we do a partition of unity, like some of which have some bump functions of theta such that sum over phi theta equals to one on this um, unit ball. And also phi theta is supported on theta. Then we define F theta as, um, sorry, this is not true. Uh, we define f theta is um, f times phi theta. Then as a consequence, we have decomposed f into sum over f theta. And so this is the first step. We uh, decompose on the frequency space. And then we cover uh, at the n minus one dimensional space by balls of radius r to the one half. So in reality, we, we need to add a delta here for uh, some technical reason, but in this lecture, let's just ignore the delta. And let phi v be a bump function on a ball of radius r to the one half centered at v. So now we can decompose further f theta by saying that the Fourier transform of theta equals to um, sum over phi uh, v 
sum over v that is in the lattice of side of distance r to the one half and f theta hat times phi v. So this is the frequency space and uh, on the physical space we we just um, further decompose f theta hat and now each f theta v will be when we take the inverse Fourier transform and we apply another bump function uh, we multiply by another fun bump function on phi theta this bump function satisfies that it equals to one on two theta and then the Fourier support is the, the, the support of phi theta is inside four theta and so th this uh, this definition might seem complicated but what I want to say is that by the uncertainty principle, phi th since uh, phi v is a bump function on a ball of radius r to the one half, phi v hat will be essentially supported on a ball of radius r to the minus a half. So when we do this, that's why when we multiply by phi v and we do the inverse Fourier transform, the support of the support of this this function equals to f theta convolved with phi v inverse Fourier transform. Since f theta is supported on theta, and then phi v the inverse Fourier transform of phi v is essentially supported on a small disk of radius about the same as theta. So what we just did is we make this function has support slightly larger, essential support slightly larger than theta. And that's why we, uh, if we cut off, we multiply it by another cutoff function, is not too different from the previous function. And that is the, um, that is the uh, wave packet decomposition. And so, uh, so for now, I think it's a good time to stop. And then um, uh, next time we will see like, how, how do we get tubes from those F theta V? Um, so next time we will continue discussing wave packet decomposition and then discuss how we use the tools uh, for of polynomial partitioning to um, study the restriction conjecture. Okay, thank you for still being here.